Okay, welcome back everyone. We are we're in Judges chapter 3. We're going to discuss just this chapter today, and then uh, we have a brief excursus on Baal. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to read your word today. We thank you for sending your spirit to cause the Bible to be written, but also to be transmitted to us, to be preserved for us, and to be open for us. Send that spirit then through the word that we may know your son, Jesus, of whom the the scriptures testify, and cling to him, rejecting all idols. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, we've talked about the cycle of the judges, right? So that you begin with peace, and then Israel's going to fall into sin. The Lord will send oppression. Israel will cry out for a deliverer. The Lord raises up a savior. And then his people will be restored. After which time will follow a period of peace. We call that the cycle of the judges, right? So we're going to begin today with the first of these cycles, and we're going to begin here. This, you are here. And the first of the judges is a man by the name of Othniel. I probably don't need to say much about him, only because we talk about him all the time. I mean, people name their kids after this guy. Uh, <laughs> It's a shame we don't really know more about Othniel because he ends up being kind of the gold standard of the judges, right? He's like the George Washington of judges. He's, he's, a, he's not only is the Lord with him, but he's a man of fine character. And he's going to be the standard by which the subsequent judges will be measured. So with that in mind, we're going to take up Judges chapter 3. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. Right. So the Lord is going to teach war to the men of Israel. Why, how, why is it they had forgotten war? They peace. Yeah, exactly. They, they had a period of peace between the days of Joshua and the beginning of Judges. And so... Their fathers may have remembered war, but they don't. They need to learn it. And in most cases, the Lord is not going to be giving miraculous deliverance to Israel. So they're going to need to learn to fight. And so the Lord's going to teach them this by what means? The remnant of the Canaanites that are still in the land that Israel did not drive out. Well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions. Every time Israel will go up to face these Canaanites, these are the Canaanites that Israel did not drive out. Okay. Verse 2. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their, and they, their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. Okay? 
You are now here, right? <clears throat> Specifically, what sins are mentioned here in these last couple of verses? Yeah, they gave their sons to their, to their ladies. They gave their daughters to their sons, right? So they intermarried with the Canaanites, which they were specifically forbidden from doing. What else did they do? They worshipped the Canaanite gods, and they lived among the Canaanites. They did not separate themselves from the Canaanites. Right? In other words, instead of making war against false gods, instead of making war against sin, God's people chose to dwell in the sin and roll around in the muck with them. That's why we're going to talk about Baal, because we're, we need to understand what it means to worship Baal. It's not just like gathering together, sitting in pews, and singing hymns to a false god. It gets much worse. I mean, that's bad all on its own, but it gets worse. Okay, so we're now here in the cycle. Israel has fallen into grave sin. I mean, in terms of sin, how bad is idolatry? It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's, it's a sin against the first commandment. And why is the first commandment the first commandment? Yeah, that one sets the stage for all the other ones, right? And, and James tells us, you keep that commandment, you'll keep all the rest. If you truly have no other gods, you'll find no need to steal. You'll trust the Lord to provide for you. You'll have no need to commit adultery. You'll be happy with the wife God gave you, and so forth, right? But idolatry is a very big deal. Because, well, actually, why? Why is idolatry a big deal? You're, you're putting things before God. You're worshiping other things as God, right? God, God specifically, specifically commanded not to do that. We just learned this today, right, in, in, our, in our catechism. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Right? God threatens to punish all who break his commandments. Therefore, we should fear him and gladly do what he commands. Israel didn't, didn't do that. Okay, so Othniel. Verse 7, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the land of Cushan Risathim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Risathim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Risathim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Risathim, so the land had rest forty years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Okay. So, we see the cycle played out here in a very simple sort of way, right? There is peace. We begin with peace. Israel begins living among the Canaanites. They begin giving their sons to their women, their daughters to their men. They intermarry. They begin worshiping the Baals. Then what happens? Yeah, the Lord's anger is kindled against them, and they end up in slavery. Now, they don't just end up in slavery, though, do they? How is it that they end up in slavery? The Lord puts them there, right? Their condition of slavery is punishment for their disobedience, right? I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That's it in action, right? That is God's warning, his, his command against sin, 
played out. Israel forgets God. The Lord places them in slavery for eight years. It's also a reminder that who is in control of all of the actions in the book of Judges? The Lord is, yes. God is in control of all of this. So they, they don't just happen to fall into this and happen, happen to receive this punishment. That we're, we're told this is directly God's punishment for their disobedience in dwelling among the Canaanites, intermarrying with them, and worshiping their gods. And so, how long are they slaves? Eight years. That's a long time. So they're slaves for eight years under the king of Mesopotamia. Now, in using the king of Mesopotamia, does the, is the Lord saying that Mesopotamia has a more favored status than Israel? No. As a matter of fact, the Lord often uses the wicked to punish his people, to chastise. Because what's the point of the punishment? Right. First of all, it shows, I mean, he, our Lord is holy. He punishes sin. There, there, there must be punishment for the sin. But the goal is for them to cry out to be restored, right? In the church, when we excommunicate someone, what's the goal? To some extent, it's to make sure that that sin doesn't spread, but the biggest thing is what? That the person be restored. That they be warned about how dire their sin is. This is how important this is. This is how big a deal your sin is. It's placing you in danger of eternal death. Right? That's what this is supposed to do with, with Israel. You were getting miracle battles. You were getting Jericho. You were, you were getting all of these wonderful, you know, famous stories of, of deliverance miraculously by the hand of the Lord. You decided you didn't want that, and so now you're the lowest of the low. You're a slave class in Mesopotamia. It reminds the people never to think that they stand when they might in fact fall, right? Let everyone take heed lest he fall. So, Israel can't say, well, God would never do that to us. Oh, yes, he would. He did. So, there they are, they're being oppressed. That does not mean that the Mesopotamians are somehow free of God's judgment themselves, right? Does God ever use the wicked to punish his people? And do those wicked ever receive punishment themselves? So, for example, in the book of Daniel, right? Judah are the slave class in what empire? Babylon. What happens to the Babylonians? They fall to the Persians, right? And what happens to the Persians? They fall to Alexander. What happens to them? They fall to the Romans, and then they just fall, right? Um, so, in other words, just because a nation is used to judge God's people, doesn't mean they're sinless. God will employ the wicked in order to, to do his will, right? What did Joseph say to his brothers? You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good, right? Does that mean it was okay for Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery or leave him for dead? No, of course not. But God, God used it for good, right? So likewise, the actions of these pagan nations that the Lord is going to use over and over and over again to enslave and otherwise chastise and punish Israel for their faithlessness, that's not going to be by accident. This is by the Lord's hand. Which sheds so much light on John chapter 8 when the Jews debating with Jesus who don't believe in him say, we're the descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves of anyone. What? I got a list as long as my arm about times your people were enslaved. Come on. 
Um, sometimes a people is really stiff-necked and they require punishment at this level. And it's going to get worse than just before Othniel. What is that, eight years? I looked, I couldn't find anything on eight years. Did, did you have anything? Right. Yeah, I, I couldn't find anything about the, that specific number. Because the next one's even weirder. The next one's 18 years. Oh, yeah, it happens again. But you knew that. Um, <laughs> yeah, spoilers. 3,000-year-old spoilers. Um, so when the people of Israel call out to the Lord, what does he do? See, this is the gospel in the book of Judges. Right? Anybody that read the account of Israel from the days of Abraham until now, or even from just from Jacob until now, if the Lord had said, you know what, you had your chance, you made your bed, now lie in it. Nobody observing that would say, you know, you were unfair, God. If anything, he's been infinitely patient up to this point. However, when they cry out, he responds. And this is the gospel, that they will fall back into sin and, and they will be punished for it. And when they call out, he will raise up a deliverer. And that's what happens. They call out, and who's the, the savior or the deliverer or the judge that's raised up in uh, this first part of Judges 3? Othniel, right? Who's Othniel? Yeah, he's uh, like a nephew of Caleb, right? And who is Caleb? Right. Caleb was one of the two spies sent into Israel in the days of Moses that reported back the Lord's given them into our hand. The other one, of course, was Joshua, right? So that means he's from the tribe of? Um, Othniel, that is, from the tribe of Judah. He's a Judahite. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. This is going to be true of all the judges. And what does Othniel do? He goes out to war, right? They're delivered by means of war. Remember that the next time someone tries to tell you Violence never solved anything. Really? That's just not true. Um, this, is, this, is the Lord's, this is the Lord's doing. This is the means by which the Lord is delivering his people, is by sending Othniel to make war on the Mesopotamians. Now, is this war against the Mesopotamians in any way a judgment against the Mesopotamians? Sure. Right? God's getting a twofer on this one. On the one hand, he's delivering Israel as he promised he would. On the other hand, the Mesopotamians are idolaters. And again, as, as we're going to learn, idolatry is not just, you're getting a couple things wrong about God in a technical sense. I mean, that's bad enough, but it's going to be filthy. It's going to be gross. And so they're engaging in all of that. The Lord is going to judge them too. Right? So both things are happening as Othniel makes war. Israel's being delivered, and the Lord's enemies are being defeated. As a matter of fact, it's not possible for the Lord to deliver his people without also defeating his enemies. Remember that on Easter. Jesus' victory is going to mean the death of death. Okay. So his hand prevailed, and the land had rest for how long? Forty years. Now that, that's, a, that's a good long time of peace and prosperity, right? And then Othniel dies. And what were we told back in chapter 2 happened when a judge died? <laughs> the King James has this lovely word, backsliding. <laughs> I, Yes, like a dog to its vomit. 
right? Returning to old habits. The drunk makes his way back to the bar. Israel makes its way back to the grove. And here we are again. And it, yeah, it's, it's like a generation, right? So now they're kids. And now the Lord will raise up the second judge, Ehud. If any of you teach Sunday school to 10-year-old boys, they love the story of Ehud. You'll see why. So, now we're back full circle. The Lord raised up Othniel, restored Israel. There's peace for 40 years. You know what comes next. And that's precisely what's going to happen. So now, verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. And notice, what is it that makes Eglon strong against Israel? The Lord, right? The Lord raises up the strength of Eglon so that Israel would be oppressed, right? Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Where's Moab, by the way? In Utah? <laughs> I thought it was a bomb. Right. <laughs> it's um Yeah, it's it's west of the of the Dead Sea, right? East of the Dead Sea. I'm backward. Okay. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. So this is a, this, th these are allies, right? This is an alliance. Three different nations. Uh, Moab, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites. They took possession of the city of Palms, and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So you see that cycle again. Now they're oppressed. They're in slavery. 18 years. Then the, Lord, or then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. Now, why is it noted that he's left-handed? We'll find out. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. Okay, so... He's left-handed, right? In Latin, we would say he uses which hand? Sinister, right? So even in English, we, we describe left-handed plots, you know, sinister plots. I think the lefties got back at us normal people because they named a serial killer after us. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so like dextrose, it's a right-handed sugar. Um, that's how I remembered it. So anyway, um, he's, he's a lefty. He's left-handed. That's a bit unusual. And he makes a sword that's a cubit long. How long is a cubit? Elbow to the tip of your middle finger, 18 inches, give or take, right? So it's not, it's not like an Italian stiletto. It's not like a little teeny dagger. But it's not like a giant Celtic broadsword, right? It's almost like the size of a Roman gladius, maybe. It's a formidable weapon. And frankly, not easy to hide. But where does he put it? The inside of his right thigh. Why his right thigh? Yeah, he's going to cross-draw, right? This tells me, and this is just an assumption on my part, this tells me that Israel has been so subjugated that, these, that the king is just not terribly afraid of them because they thought to check the one leg for a sword, which is why he had to be left-handed, but they didn't check the other one for an 18-inch long sword with two edges. So anyway, why has is, why is Ehud gone to Eglon? Well, yeah, we, we, we know why he's gone. What's, what's the pretense? Tribute. Yeah, tribute. What's a tribute? Uh, taxes. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're going to bring money or a gift, some kind of offering to the king. Right? 
What king could turn that down? Well, also, if you don't do it, they come and extract. Yeah, it's also, it also gets extracted, yes. It's, there is a payment aspect to it. So, um, Ehud goes to the king. Uh, verse 17, he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded, silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. Right? So Ehud tells the king, Eglon, I have a secret message for you. And so the king sends all of the attendants away. Again, I don't think he's terribly afraid of the Israelites. Yeah, right, yeah. Is, is there buried treasure? Is, is this a guy trying to win his freedom by telling me like some, some opportunity I might get to get some gold or some land or like my enemy has some weakness or something? I mean, I'm, he, he's interested. He wants to know. So he sends away all of his servants and it's just Ehud and Eglon, mano a mano. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. What's a roof chamber? It's going to be like a bathroom. Yeah. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade for he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the dung came out. I told you, teach it to 10 year old boys. You've got their attention. It's very graphic. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. I mean, it, it's kind of comical the way it's portrayed because... King's been in there an awful long time. Should we go check on him? Eh, let's give him a minute. It's been like, it's been a long time. Should we go in? Give him five more minutes. Uh, you know, I mean, you can just imagine, right? They're, they don't want to interrupt the king. They don't want to anger him, but it's been a while. Haven't heard anything. Do um, you think Elijah was referencing this? Do, he said it? So was Elijah referencing this? I, I've often wondered the same thing because it, it's the same word, I think. Um, the same idea. Right, the same concept. He's, he's relieving himself. Yeah, well, yeah, well, like, no, it's like, you're not dead. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so, um, verse 25, And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah, when he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the, hill, then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies the Moabites into your hand. Ah, so here the Lord has given the Moabites into the hand of Israel. It's, it's almost like we're back in the book of Judges, right? So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at the time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So really an almost Joshua-esque battle here. You have 10,000, and not just 10,000 people, 10,000 men, and not just 10,000 men, 10,000 able-bodied men, and not just heavy casualties, not a man's left alive. Their destruction was utter. And not only is the king dead, but what? It was a humiliating death. It was an absolutely... In other words, he didn't die with his boots on. He didn't die in battle, a tragic sort of, you know, well, he went down fighting kind of thing. No, he was... 
he was killed in a very humiliating way. And so the land has rest for how long? 80 years. What does 80 years of peace and prosperity do to the soul of a nation? Just wondering aloud. Just throwing that out there. Um, the third judge, Shamgar, gets a single verse. Because of this, we consider him a minor judge. We're not told much about him, and, and his victory, while certainly great, it's not quite on the same level as Ehud, right? The 10,000 able-bodied men. But still in this verse, uh, verse 31, after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. So ox goad is a long pole. You knock off like the, the clumps of soil off, off of the plow, and you also use it to keep the, goat, the, the ox moving, hence the name. Yeah, I mean, he, and he used that to slay 600 Philistines. All right, so now we have the two handouts. So this, this handout here that begins with the timeline gives you kind of an idea of what's going on in other parts of the civilized world at this time. So on the left, you've got what's going on in, in what would become Greece, I guess. Um, you also, in the next one, have what's going on in Egypt. Then the, the fourth column, what's going on in Canaan. And then lastly, what's going on in Mesopotamia. The next page... We have a list of the judges, beginning with Othniel. So as you see, next week we're going to be talking about Deborah. But this shows where they show up in the Bible. And notice, by the way, many of the judges are not found only in the book of Judges. Many of them are found elsewhere. So for example, you have um, Deborah and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson showing up in the book of Hebrews. The next page we have something on the, the Ishmaelites and the Midianites, and on what the vocation was of, of the judges. And then on the last page we have just some, some kind of chronological information, how we, how we go about dating the times and the reign of the, of the judges. And these are all from some of these books that I've had sitting out here for a few weeks. It kind of helps with Bible history. The next thing we've got is about Baal. At some point, we've got to talk about Baal. Sometimes I've heard this pronounced Baal. Um, I think in the original it's going to be Baal. That apostrophe indicates that there's an unvoiced consonant. Some languages have consonants that don't really make much of a sound. Um, Hebrew and Arabic have ayin or ayin. Um, that it's like a little bit of a, of a hitch or a glottal stop. Um, you don't really hear it too much, but there's a pause in the sound, and so you'll, you'll sometimes see that as, as an indication. So like... Um, the national newspaper of Israel, of, of the, the modern state of Israel. <clears throat> Those are two words, the world, right? So it's ha'aretz. There's a, there's a bit of a stop between the two. Um, that kind of sound is intended here. So in the original, it would be ba'al, but... It's not uncommon to take a foreign word and pronounce it according to the rules of your own language. So when I'm talking about Baal, yeah, it should be Baal, but I'm going to say Baal. That's, that's, I think that's how, that's how I grew up hearing it anyway, was Baal. Um, Baal is a Canaanite and Mesopotamian god. 
So um, where's Canaan? Canaan is all the lands we've been talking about in the book of Joshua and Judges, right? Where's Mesopotamia? Yeah, it's, it's east and north of, of Canaan. It, it, literally, the Greek Mesopotamia means in the midst of the rivers, in the middle of the rivers. So it's between the Tigris and the Euphrates. What, what modern-day state occupies that land? Iraq? Right? So like Baghdad is between those two rivers. Um, what do we know about Mesopotamia? One of the few parts of that, that area of the world you can actually grow things. You can, yeah, it's, it's, it's fertile, very desirable land. And what does prosperity tend to do to, to a people's soul, hypothetically? Yeah, and it did there too. So, <laughs> so, so the Mesopotamians and the Canaanites have this, have this god Baal. By no means was Baal the only god worshipped, right? Um, but he's going to be kind of the king god, right? There is some, some mythology about Baal maybe having a dad, El. El, by the way, is the Hebrew word for God. We, we joked back in the day when Lutheran Brotherhood and Aid Association for Lutherans merged. It, if you put it together, it would pronounce El Baal. <laughs> Oops. Um, but a lot like the, the mythology of Zeus, did Zeus have a dad? Kronos, right? But he was kind of dead. He wasn't really in the picture. Stay with me. That's, that's kind of how L is working. Maybe he had a beginning, maybe not. Who knows? Um, sometimes he was called the son of Dagon. Dagon's another, another god of the area. Killing her. So... Um, the, na the nature of Baal, Baal means master or possessor, meaning that he, he possesses the land over which he is the, the, the regional god. He's the kind of god people take up when they stop being nomads and they begin dwelling in a certain part of the land, right? And, and, and various peoples at various times will talk about a certain, part, a certain land having a certain spirit or a certain... They may not even know what to call it, but something watching over that land specifically. And so that's how they're going to describe Baal. He's going to be a regional god for these different regions, but he's going to be found in all of these various regions. Um, Baal is going to be a god typically involved with providing rain and, and good weather. Um, because this, this part of the world is not, um, it's not desolate, it's not the Negev, it's not the moon. You can grow things there, but it's not Iowa either. I mean, like where I grew up in the Midwest, you just accidentally drop a seed, you'll have a beautiful plant there in a couple months. Just anywhere there's any, any soil of any type, cracks on the sidewalk, you got grass growing, everything. You spit out watermelon seeds, and next year there's watermelon plants. Um, this kind of agriculture is tougher, and not only is it is it tough because of the of the climate, but it's unpredictable. So you'll get rain, but the rain comes at the wrong time and the wrong amounts. And so you you, you look at the the annual rainfall, and it looks like it could sustain life, but if that rain comes at the wrong time, the crops are stop me if you've heard this one before. You know, you, you can grow things in West Texas, but you got to be on it. And even if you do everything right, if the rain comes, but it comes at the wrong time, you're in trouble. And so they, they devote a lot of their piety toward the worship of Baal. But again, it's not just praying to some invisible deity about, hey, send some rain. 
whenever it comes to paganism, the practices associated with the worship of these gods are, they're shocking. And so um, there's a citation here where it says the Canaanites. And this is from a, a book in the 1950s by a, a Edward E. Voss from uh, Moody Press. He says, one may question that those ancient enemies of Israel were as evil as the Bible claims that they were. But even a superficial glance at Canaanite religion alone ably demonstrates their iniquity. Base sex worship was prevalent, and religious prostitution even commanded. Human sacrifice was common, and it was a frequent practice in an effort to placate their gods, to kill young children and bury them in the foundations of a house or public building at the time of construction. Joshua 6.26, in his days did he all the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn. Right? Remember when Jericho was destroyed and there was a curse? Don't rebuild it or it's going to come with the blood of your firstborn. Well, they rebuilt Jericho. And what they do? They sacrificed the guy's firstborn and he was placed in the foundation of the city. So, in other words, it's, it's not like they're becoming like adherents of a false religion that maintains the veneer of Christianity but just gets God wrong. It's not like they're not becoming Mormons, right? It's not like they're just getting the Trinity wrong and having family game night. They're killing their children and putting them in the foundations of their cities, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so far depraved. that we don't weep over God's judgment on them at all. I mean, thank God for putting an end to this disgusting practice. And so, um, when, when the Lord delivers Israel, he'll also take the opportunity to, to destroy some Canaanites. Okay. There are a couple of paragraphs about archaeological discoveries uh, involving Baal. On page two, we're reminded, of course, of the incident on Mount Carmel with Elijah the prophet. Remember that one? And how did that one go? Right? They build two altars. They place the sacrifice on top of the altar. The priests of Baal go first. How do the priests of Baal go about trying to get their, their idol's attention? Yeah, they, they, they cry out. That doesn't work. They start limping around the altar. That doesn't work. And so they start cutting themselves. In other words, the worship of their God involves the destruction of their own bodies. And by the way, the worship of pagan gods is always going to involve some perversion of nature. Right? Now, what do I mean when I say perversion of nature? When we talk about sin, sin is the result of some kind of desire. Right? Desires, especially those, those caused by God, have a lawful object. Right? So when, man, or when, when God creates man... He gives man desire for woman, right? It's natural for a man to desire a woman. God institutes marriage so that man's natural desire for women would be focused on not just women, but on the wife that God gave him, right? That's, that's the lawful object of that desire. Now, if a man looks lustfully at a woman who's not his wife, He's, he's acting in accord with his nature. That is, his, his desire is to desire women, but he is to restrain himself, restrain his flesh, so that that desire is, is only going toward his own wife. So he's acting in accord with nature, but he's not... It's still sinful, but it's at least in accord, it's in harmony with the nature that God gave, right? It's natural for a man to desire a woman. The problem is God didn't give her to you. That's, that's why it's a sin. But there are sins that are absolutely contrary to nature. In fact, that's what the term perversion means. 
To be perverted means to be torn upside down, right? So that the desire is now contrary to nature. So, for example, in the worship of Baal, you have parents willfully giving their children over to sacrifice. The natural affinity of a parent is to protect their children, right? So that like if, let's say, a, let's, let's say a father is defending his family from an intruder, and as he's defending his family from an intruder, he allows for a moment a, a small amount of hatred to enter into his heart. Is that sinful? Well, sure, but it's at least in accord with his duties as a father, right? Because it's, it's born of his affection for his family, right? He loves his family so much, he's willing to devote extreme violence to this attacker who's threatening them. That's in accord with his nature. What's contrary to nature is for the father to give his child to the priest to sacrifice him. But that's what's happening in large quantity. So it's, it's not just that it happened a couple of times. It happened lots of times. And as, as we do more excavation of these pagan lands, Carthage, for example, um, Carthage had oodles of child sacrifice. Um, and by the way, who were the Carthaginians before they were in Carthage? They were Phoenicians. And who were the Phoenicians before they were Phoenicians? Philistines. Yeah. So next time you read about the Punic Wars, don't, don't cry too much over, over Carthage. It's not to say Rome was, was terribly virtuous, but man, Carthage's destruction, they had that coming a long time. Um, and, you know, to bring it closer to home, don't cry too much over Cortez. So, um, likewise, their, their, their breaking of the six commandments. When it comes to worshiping pagan gods, it is almost always going to involve sexual perversions. Again, let me know if you find any relevance to the modern day here. But, um, so when Israel falls into worshiping idols, again, they're not becoming Mormons. In other words, they're not retaining the veneer of the true religion, but getting things wrong about the theology, which is bad. It, it, that is damnable. They're sliding into open, utter, depraved paganism and all of their disgusting practices, especially against the Fifth and Sixth Commandments. Yes? Do you think Mormonism uh, Only in the most outward, superficial sense. <laughs> It makes it more dangerous, really. Agreed. Oh, no, agreed. 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 But I mean, they're, what they're sliding into doesn't even have the trappings, the outward appearance of the true religion. As a matter of fact, that's what makes Mormonism dangerous, is that it, to the uninitiated, it looks like Christianity. You know? We've got family game night. We've got happy families. They don't start off with Heavenly Father and Mary not being a virgin. You only find that stuff later. Um, yeah, and so Israel keeps falling into this idolatry. And in a way, that's kind of how each of us is in that we, we fall into sin and we're restored. But as a nation, they are really given to this sin in ways that are not necessarily true of every nation that converts to Christianity. The Germans, the French, the Norwegians, the, I mean the Vikings, when they become Christians, they don't slide into paganism like this. I mean, the Scandinavians don't start practicing paganism in large numbers again until about the 21st century, unfortunately. Um, these guys are just absolutely addicted to to, pay, to, to worship of Baal. And so, it's important to know this, one, because Baal is going to keep showing up, right? They're going to keep sliding into the worship of this false god. 
and he's going to show up in Judges. He's going to show up in uh, the books of the Kings. One of the most famous and, and worst practitioners of Baal worship is going to be a man called Ahab. And of course, when the king is into it, the people go with him, right? And so he's going to bring a lot of, of problems onto his country. Uh, but you're going to find it in the prophets. So that's why we're taking the, the opportunity to, to see this. There are various names of, of Baal in Scripture. This is on the middle of page two. So you've got uh, the, the Baal of good fortune, the Baal of wealth, the Baal, uh, Baal's village, um, uh, Baal of the dwelling, Baal of the opening, Baal of the palm tree. And then, of course, you've got Baal Zebub, right? Baal Zebub, the Lord of the flies. I mean, his name is the Lord of the flies. Why would you worship? But this, this, this is what makes it a perversion and an abomination, is that this is so contrary, not just, not just to, what, to what Christians should be. It's contrary to just common sense. Why would you worship something calling itself the Lord of the Flies? But here they are, right? So there, there are some interesting quotes about Baal on pages 2 and 3. You can look at... Um, in, in Smith's Bible Dictionary, on the bottom of page 3, that we have the definition here. He's the, the supreme male divinity of the Phoenician and Canaanitish nations, as Ashtoreth was their supreme female divinity. Right. So Baal and Ashtoreth go together. And by the way, Baal is singular. In the plural, you'll see it written out as Balaam, sometimes maybe. Um, Asherah. The plural of Asherah, and that's a feminine name, that ah ending like Sarah, um, is going to be Ash-Toreth. I say that only because you'll sometimes find these written in Bible dictionaries and, and elsewhere in the singular, sometimes in the plural. Just know these are equivalent, just one singular, one's plural. Um, so Baal is decidedly masculine. And Asherah is decidedly feminine. So where Baal is a, is a fertility god related to the crops, Asherah is going to be a female goddess related more toward um, sexuality and fertility uh, in people, right? And there's, there's, a, there's a decent case to be made that these might correspond to other, other pagan gods we might know, um, so that like Jupiter and Venus, for example, it's in there in the, with the Roman gods. So who are the Greek counterparts for Jupiter and Venus? Zeus and Hera? Right. So, I mean, Baal's the king god. Zeus is the king god. Jupiter's the king god. You see some similarities here. The devil? What about him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. These, these are absolutely demons. Um, um, in the New Testament, it, it says that explicitly. Yeah, these, these are demons. And they keep showing up. I mean, Jesus describes demons as wandering the earth, searching for places, you know. And so they, they keep popping up. But yeah, absolutely, this is the work of the devil. Yeah. Um. Okay, um, page four. The name and the character of Baal. There seems to be some association with the sun. He's both beneficent and destructive. That is to say, he gives light and warmth, but he also destroys. Um, the, he, he gives the heats of the summer. He destroys the vegetation. And so for that reason, because he is, he's both um, beneficent and vengeful, they attempt to placate uh, his wrath by offering sacrifice to him. So again, back to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. 
the priests of Baal start cutting themselves, destroying themselves to appease their God. And of course, what happens? Nothing. So how does, what was the name of the true prophet that was there that day? Elijah. And what does Elijah do to get the Lord's attention? Simple prayer. Oh, oh, Elijah's absolutely the patron saint of trash talking. And that's, that's exactly what Elijah, our Elijah, says. Um, you know, where is your God? Is he out relieving himself? Yeah, ex yeah, yeah. Well, he is a God. I mean, that's what he says. Cry out for he is a God. You know, is, right? You told me he's a God. Where is he? Is he listening? Maybe be a little louder. Maybe your God's hard of hearing. Maybe he's out relieving himself. He's totally trash talking him. And then Elijah, when it comes time to, to be his turn, because nothing happened with the priests of Baal, one simple prayer, prayed to the Lord, and and Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can make this shot. Raise the hoop up another foot, would you? <laughs> okay, now uh, tie one hand behind my back. I mean, he really, he pours, he, he literally pours it on, right? Dig a moat around the thing, drench the whole thing in water, fill up the moat with the water, and the fire comes down from the Lord and consumes what? The sacrifice, the altar, the moat, everything, right? It's a wonderful Sunday school story because it shows you there's no there's no comparison between the the Baal. I mean, he's not real. His servants cut themselves and destroy their bodies for what? For nothing. What do the priests of Baal get out of this? A bunch of cuts on their body and then then they get put to the sword. Right. So their time on earth is full of destruction and misery, and their end is death. Elijah, on the other hand, what's his end? When does Elijah die? He doesn't die! The Lord answers his simple prayer, and the fire, it's, it doesn't just like technically consume just the little bit that needed consumed. It was all-consuming, everything. Right? It shows that the Lord has tremendous power over Baal, over creation. And, and then, of course, Elijah, what's his end? He's not put to the sword. He doesn't even die. He's carried up with the, in, into the whirlwind, into heaven. He doesn't have to taste death. Lucky. <laughs> There's just no comparison, right? Okay. Does that make Elijah a judge? Literally defeats the Baals. There's a little bit of a character of a judge in that, isn't there, in, in defeating the Baals? I like it. I don't know. Um, so lastly, there are several Bible verses that are listed here regarding Baal. One little, um, one little postscript on Asherah. Asherah was worshipped by taking a tree, a tall tree, and stripping off the branches and replanting the trunk as a tree. Um, now, if you've ever set a fence post, <laughs> let's just say that if, if fence posts were trees, West Texas would be a forest, and it's not. So, um, but that's what they do. They, they take what is living, destroy it, replant it in the ground, and then pray to it as a fertility goddess. Again, it's, it's, it's contrary to nature. But... Um, they would plant these things in groves. And I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, hills, high places. Kind of, yeah. But um, so when you hear about the, the, the Asherah pole, that's what that is. You take the tree, lop off the limbs, plant it in the ground, and those are the Asherah poles. And those, those will find their way even into the temple in Jerusalem. And so when. Um, when you hear about the good kings of Israel or Judah tearing down the high places, that's what they mean. They're tearing down the altars and the, and the poles. All right, any last questions? So next week we're going to take up Deborah. We're going to look at Deborah the judge. So let's close with the Lord's Prayer.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.